All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Advanced Kentucky's content review sessions for AP Computer Science A. This is our third session. Uh, we are happy to be joined by Rob Schultz today from Bellbrook High School, College Board Consultant, AP Exam Guru. Um, so before we get started, just make sure you have the link to today's handouts. It's bit.ly slash mathcrs. I'll put that in the chat here in a second. Uh, but that's where you can find the handouts and resources that Rob will be using today. And while this online review session is intended for a Kentucky audience, I, I know we have lots of people, well, we have a handful of people from outside Kentucky, so welcome. Uh, we'll do everything we can to make this as engaging and interactive as possible. Um, any participant causing disruption will be removed, and AP is a trademark registered by the College Board, which is not affiliated with or does not, or and does not endorse this product. Advanced Kentucky and uh, my contact information can be found on the screen. Give us a, a follow, look us up. Uh, tweet us out, whatever you need to do. If you have any follow-up questions, comments, concerns, feel free to email me as well. Uh, your microphones and videos are going to be off for this session, but your chat is open. So please, please, please ask questions. Ask Rob anything you want um, exam related. If you're a teacher, ask him, you know, wh whatever kinds of teaching questions. If you're a student, uh, you know, content questions, any anything is fair game. Uh, I'll make sure Rob gets those questions. You can send those questions directly to me if, if you don't feel comfortable putting them in the chat to everyone, or you can put them in the chat to everyone, uh, whatever you feel most comfortable with. But um, this will only be as engaging as what you make it. So please make sure you are using the chat. We will post a recording of today's session on the uh, bit.ly slash ADVKY website. And you can also find information about past review sessions as well as upcoming review sessions as well. So that will be up uh, most likely by tomorrow. Uh, depends on how much basketball I get trapped watching. So um, <laughs> with, with all that said, Rob, I'm gonna turn things over to you. You can introduce yourself and then take it away. My bracket's already blown. I had Ohio State winning the whole thing. So oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, my name is Rob Schultz. Good morning, everybody. Um, glad everybody glad everybody um, is able to make it this morning. Um, I know it's a, a at least here it's a nice sunny day. And um, so I appreciate the fact that you're inside with us today to, to join and kind of work through some of the things we're going to work through. Um, as Aaron said, my name is Rob Schultz. I teach at Bellbrook High School in Bellbrook, Ohio. Um, I've been teaching, this is year 21, and I've been teaching AP Computer Science A for the past 20 years. Um, I've been an, uh, involved with the AP reading process since 2008. Um, so I, 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 and I've also been a work, workshop consultant for the past three years. So I enjoy doing this kind of stuff. I, I enjoy, um, you know, sharing what I know and, and doing different things. So one of the nice things about having a small group like this is that um, we can do it more as more as like a, a you know, a face to face classroom environment. So please feel free if you have questions, um, you are welcome to put them in the chat. I know Aaron said he's he's monitoring the chat. But as we work through different things, feel free to unmute and ask questions as we go. And I'm happy to do that. It's a little different if we have a huge group that we can't really do that. So one of the benefits of a smaller group is that we can we can unmute at times and ask questions. Um, if, if Aaron, that's something that they have access to do. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll turn off. So so yeah, so the, the videos will leave off. But if you want to unmute yourself, okay. I'll go right ahead. Yeah, please feel feel free to, to jump in and ask questions as we go. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see, where do I wanna be? There we go. So um, for the first hour that we're together, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about object-oriented programming. And I'm probably gonna pause every once in a while. That's one of the downsides of doing this virtually is I have to shuffle screens around from time to time. So let's see, let me find the best place to kind of put everybody here. There we go. All right, so we're gonna start by talking about object-oriented programming. Um, and I guess one of the first things, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn the chat on so I can see it on my side too. Um, because we've only got an hour together, I don't want to spend part of that hour um, talking about things that everybody already knows. So I'm going to kind of open open this up to just some general, take a minute or two and type into the chat what you know about classes and objects. Or, or maybe we should start this way. I know we've got a group that that involves both teachers and students. Um, so is there is there any way we could figure out um, with cameras turned off? Is there any way we could figure out how many students we have and how many teachers we have? How about we do this? Um, I'm going to kind of open this up so I see a whole grid of people. Um, if you are a student, uh, hit the little option to raise your hand if you know how to do that. I don't know. Maybe this isn't going to work if we're not if we're not proficient with Zoom. We might not know how to do the hand raise thing. 
Okay, so I'm seeing one, two, three, four, four students, five students. Oh, you guys know your Zoom, all right. Okay, so it looks like we've got about a 50-50 mix. Okay, um, so what I'd like to do is I wanna kind of focus on this from both the student standpoint and then I'll throw some things in for the teachers every once in a while too. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to do this with, uh, with microphones turned off. Um, one of the things that I'd like to kind of find out before we get started is what you've already covered with classes, because again, I don't want to spend time covering things that you've already covered. So for the students that are out there, um, are there any specific questions you have about classes or um, are there things that you already know about classes? What kind of things do you know at this point? And again, feel free to unmute and share if you want. I'd love to hear your voices. Yeah, definitely. Hello, sir. So what I... I've been having trouble with is kind of constructing like the whole thing, uh, not the individual components. I know how to do like, I think it was public class, and then I know how to write that class um, name and the methods, but I don't know how to like construct whether it's private or whether this method goes here or this method goes here. Okay. All right. We'll make sure we hit those things. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, anybody else have anything specific? Okay, it's quiet. You guys are like like my own students. Um, everybody has questions, but nobody wants to speak. So, okay, so here's what we're going to do. Um, so, um, Mahmoud, right? Did I say that right? Yes, sir. You're one of the few people that says it right for the first time. Okay, um, we'll definitely make sure we hit on that. But again, as we're going through some things, my, my plan is to share some general information about classes and then we're gonna jump over and I'm gonna share a different screen and we're actually gonna construct a class from the ground up. So, so as we're working, again, I can't stress this enough, please feel free to ask questions as, as we go. Okay, I love doing this the way I would do a regular classroom and I encourage my own students to do that as, as we're working, so. And then um, did, you, did you see Rob, there was another comment about uh, information as well. Uh, Classes have kit methods, set methods, and constructors. Yes, you're absolutely correct. That's, in fact, that's one of the things we're going to review just a little bit. So I'm glad you shared that. So, so you guys do know some things about classes at this point. Okay, so that's great that we have a kind of a base to start from. Um, so, okay, one of the things that I like to do when I when I start introducing classes, and and you've you've told me that you already have a little bit of a base, so that means we can move through this part a little quicker. So I appreciate that. Um, but one of the things I like to stress when we go back and we review classes and objects is that there are a lot of different analyses analogies that you can use um, when you talk about the relationship between a class and an object. Um, you know, I've heard some teachers say that a class is like a cookie cutter, and then the objects are the actual cookies that we, we can create, the actual objects that we can do things with. Um, one of the analogies I like is that a class is like a factory that produces some specific object and then the objects are the things that the factory produces so you can picture this factory that creates cars you know i can't get in the factory and drive the factory or you know do different things like that but the factory produces a bunch of cars and the, the cars become the actual objects um, one of the analogies i like to use is that a class is like a blueprint and then the objects are like the houses that we build using the blueprint Whoops, someone went the wrong way. So if you think about it, um, with a class being like a blueprint, I take a paper blueprint for a house, and then I can tell you just about anything about the physical house that I'm going to build that I, I want off of that blueprint. I can tell you the dimensions of the house. I can tell you how many floors. I can tell you the way the plumbing will be laid out. I can tell you um, you know, where the bathrooms will be in relation to the kitchen and the, the bedrooms and, and all that good stuff. Um, I can tell you just about anything I want about the houses that I'll create using that blueprint, but I can't really do anything with the blueprint other than describe what the house will be like, okay? Um, and along that same lines, an object is an instance of a class. So a blueprint, um, or, or I should say a house is like something that I can construct looking at the blueprint. Um, just like with a blueprint, I can create as many houses as I want. I can take one set of blueprints and go into an open field and I can build as many houses as I can fit in that field. I can take one class and I can construct as many objects as I want from that class. So I don't have to have a specific class for each specific object. Um, if I create a class to represent a house, I can construct as many house objects as I want from that one class. Um, each object has the attributes and the behavior that are defined in the class. So when I create a class, 
I'm defining what the properties of, of the object will be. I'm defining what the behavior of the object will be. Um, so I, I can tell you, like I said, looking at a blueprint, I can tell you, you know, where the bathroom will be, where the kitchen will be, where the bedrooms will be. I can't necessarily tell you what color the walls will be painted because that's a property of the specific house. Um, so there are some things open that that we can change the specific properties. So a class defines the properties of its objects. You know, I could specify in the blueprint that that the homeowner, when they build, um, has the availability to make the outside brick or maybe siding, um, you know, wood, different things like that. Um, so there are going to be some options built in that that I can change as I construct all of these objects. Um, each object stores its own property values. So if I go into an area and I build 20 houses, I might have every single house that has different properties, even though they have the same design and the floor plan's the same and the plumbing is the same. Um, I might have a blue kitchen in one house. I might have a green kitchen in the other house. I might have a red kitchen in the other house. Um, so each object stores its own property values. And then the class also defines the behavior of its objects. And when we get to this one, because they all share the same behavior, I don't have to share the behavior at the object level. Um, I can go back to the class because all of that can be stored in one spot. So, um, so those, those are just a few of the details as far as the differences between classes and objects, okay? Um, when we talk about properties, properties are the things that each object has to remember about itself. So again, if I'm talking about a house, um, you know, it could be the type of shingles that I use for the roof. It could be the, the, the material that I use for the outside of the house. It could be the colors of paint that I use for the walls inside. Those are the things that are going to be different about each individual house, even though they were built with the same set of blueprints. Well, objects are the same way. I can create an object and it's going to have its own, op um, own properties that are going to make it a little bit different from all of the other objects that were, that were were created from the same class. Um, depending on the textbook you look at, and this is where things will get a little confusing, properties go by a lot of different names. Um, I can refer to properties, obviously, as properties. Properties can also be referred to as instance variables. I've heard properties referred to as state variables. And I've heard properties referred to as global variables because they're global to the entire class. So, so all of these are basically different names for the same thing. These all refer to the properties of a specific object. Okay. Um, so again, as we get over into JGrasp and we start doing some programming, um, we'll we'll talk about all of these things kind of as we go. Okay. But again, I just wanted to kind of lay a little bit of groundwork. Um, so that that is our. Um, that's our kind of intro to properties. The one other definition I want to throw in here is the state of an object. Um, and I don't know if you've heard this term before, but we, we all know that at times maybe the governor will give the state of the state address or the president will give the state of the union address. And the purpose of that address is to describe what the state, like when the president gives the state of the union address, he's telling us what the state of the country is at that exact point in time. You know, this is where we are with education. This is where we are with the economy. This is where we are with, with health. I mean, all these different things. Um, so it's a snapshot of what's going on in the country at that point in time. Well, when we talk about the state of the object, it's the same idea. We're talking about what is the state of our object at this exact point in time. And the only way really we can know what the state of the object is, is to look at the contents of its properties. So at, at this given point in time, um, you know, if I've created a house object at this point in time, um, the outside of the house is brick, the color of the kitchen is green, the color of the bedroom is blue, the color of the bathroom is red. Um, so we can talk about the properties and those properties can change. One example I give my own students when we talk through this is that if I think of myself as an object, I am a, a person, uh, I'm an object created from a person class, okay? I have specific properties. I have a name, I have my age, I have my hair color, I have, you know, the outfit that I'm wearing, I have my location, maybe I think of it as X, Y, and Z coordinates. Um, my state is constantly changing. Right now, um, I'm sitting here in front of you speaking. Um, I have my X, Y, Z location within my house. I can pinpoint my exact location. Um, I have my age. Um, but five minutes from now, my state is going to be slightly different. My name will still be the same, but my age is going to be five minutes older than I was five minutes ago. Uh, my location might be slightly different. Maybe I'm shifted a little bit different in my seat. So, so just like just like people or cars or or anything else, um, objects the state can change constantly as we do different things within our programs. So, oh, if well, you hear the, quick, yeah, sorry. go ahead. Quick question: uh, Mahmoud asks, are they the property of a class or an object? 
Um, they're the properties of an object. Okay, so so when we're talking about specific properties, we're defining the properties for a specific object. Um, let's say, for example, well, in a second, we're going to create a class, um, and once I create that class, we're going to construct three different, three or four different objects from that class. Each one of them will have its own set of properties. So I can't really talk about the properties of the class. You know, that class is just a blueprint. Again, it's just, you know, you can think of it as a piece of paper. So I can't really think of, of the properties of the specific class. The properties are attached to each one of the individual objects. That's a good question. Okay. Um, okay, so let's go on. So um, when we talk about classes, again, we have two different things we have to look at. We have to look at properties and we have to look at behavior. Uh, I lost my mouse. There we go. So when we talk about behavior, these are the things that we can tell an object to do or the questions that we can ask an object about itself. Um, let's see, an example would be if I go into the bank, um, I, I like using this one with my students because it always kind of gets a chuckle at one point. But if I walk into a bank, there's a set behavior for a bank teller object. Um, there's a list of things that that bank teller has been trained to do and they have a set of instructions to follow. If I walk into the bank and say bank teller dot withdrawal 50, Okay, and I'm kind of Java, you know, I'm putting putting the instructions I would I would give the bank teller into Java terms. But if I walk into the bank and ask the bank teller for a, you know, I tell a bank teller I want to make a fifty dollar withdrawal, the bank teller has a set of instructions. They have a little protocol that they follow to to follow those instructions and and you know give me what I'm asking for. Um, so when we think about the things, the the behavior of a bank teller, I can go in and I can say I'd like to make a withdrawal. I can go in and say I'd like to make a deposit. Um, I can go in and ask for my account balance. I can go in and say this is a stick up. You know that's the one that always gets the chuckle from the students. But but that's honestly something that the bank teller has been trained for. They have a protocol that they follow. And if someone comes in and says this is a stick up, they have a set of instructions that they're supposed to follow. If I walk into the bank and I say, you know, I'd like an order of, I'd like a cheeseburger and a side of fries. That's not part of a bank teller's behavior. That's not something that would be part of the things that a bank teller would be able to deal with. So, so that's not one of the things that I can ask a bank teller object to do or a question I can ask about themselves, okay? So when we start working with classes, we have to know what that behavior is. We have to know what the things are that that, that specific object can do. And we also have to know what, what the protocol is for asking them those things. So one of the things we'll look at as we get into JGrasp and we start typing, um, as I start typing, is we'll talk about um, you know things like um, the the method header. You know what it what's the return type of a method. You know what's the uh, what are the parameters. If I walk into the bank and say I'd like to make a withdrawal. And then I just stand there. The bank teller is going to just kind of stare at me because I haven't given them complete information. I didn't. I didn't tell them how much I want to withdraw. Um, and similarly, if I ask for a withdrawal, the return type is going to be whatever the amount of money is that I've asked for. So I have to know what that that complete. Um, I, I have to know how to complete that instruction. So we need to know what what the method header is, and we'll talk about that kind of stuff. Um, let's see. It looks like it was. Uh, Lath was the one that asked about methods and set methods and constructors, and that's where we're going to go at this point. So I'm glad he brought that up. Um, when we create the behavior or when we define the behavior of a class or the objects that are going to come from that class, we do that by creating methods. And there are really three different types of methods. First, we've got constructors, and that's a special type of method, sort of. Um, technically, a constructor isn't considered a method, but it kind of is because it kind of falls into that same category. Constructors have a very specific purpose. And I'll be honest with you, the main reason I like the blueprint and the house um, analogy to the difference between classes and objects is because we construct a house. You know, you have a construction team that comes in and they construct a house very similarly to what a constructor does in a class when we go to create an instance of an object, okay? Uh, we have to construct it. There's a constructor method that, that we run when we, when we create the object, when we instantiate the object. And the constructor's purpose is to give all of the properties their initial values. I mean, that's its job. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and we'll talk about some details about constructors as we go to. Um, but constructors are a very special type of method. If you think of it as a method, um, it has a very specific purpose. It has a very specific way we identify it. And its job is to construct the object and give it its initial values. 
as we go. Okay. Um, the other two types of methods are called accessors, and some textbooks refer to them as getters because we're getting information about the state of the object. We're going out and we're accessing the instance variables and we're getting information. And then the other one is called a mutator. Um, mutators actually mutate the object. They change it in some way. So, so a mutator would be where we go out and we change information. And those are also referred to in some textbooks as setter methods because we're going out to the properties or the instance variables and we're setting them. Um, you, you may have, as you were working with strings, heard the, the term immutable. You know, you may have heard your teacher say that strings are immutable. Well, immutable kind of goes back to this idea that we can't mutate them, we can't change them. So as we're working with strings, um, I, I can't go out and I can't change a specific character because strings are immutable, they can't be mutated. But as we create our own objects, as we define what the behavior of those objects are going to be when we create the class, we can put in mutator methods that will let us change the instance variables. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm looking at the chat, still no questions. So that's, that's good. Okay, anybody have questions at this point? Feel free to unmute. This is a good place to stop and ask before we start actually doing some coding stuff. We do have a question. Okay. Can you give an analogy between accessors and mutators? Can I give an analogy between accessors and mutators? Um, yes. And again, when we go in and code, I'll show you some examples of that too. But um, let's say, uh, you guys are probably too young to remember this, but there used to be these little virtual pet keychains back in the 80s and 90s, and I can't remember what the name of them were. Um, any of the teachers in the room remember what those were called? You would have this little virtual pet that you would carry on a keychain, and then every once in a while it would beep, and you would look, and it would say, you know, I'm hungry or something like that, so you would have to hit a button to feed it. Tamagotchi. Thank you. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So, so with those, you could almost picture you've created this class that you've generated this little virtual object, this little virtual pet. Um, and every once in a while, um, there's a method that runs that goes out and it gets maybe it's hunger level. Maybe that's one of the properties is how hungry it is. So we're, we're getting information about that object and it's coming back and it's telling us the hunger level is 50%, which means it's hungrier. The hunger level is 25%. So it's a question I'm asking about itself. Or I could even I could even implement something where I could ask it, how hungry are you? I'm not changing anything. I'm not feeding it. I'm not doing anything with it. But it's going out and it's looking at a specific property that was defined to tell me what its hunger level is. And then it's returning that back to me. So that would be an accessor. I'm asking it a question. It's giving me information back. Okay, well, if I realize that my pet is hungry, I can hit a little button to say, okay, give the pet 10 food pellets or I mean, whatever it was, I, I don't remember how that worked. But now I'm changing things. Okay, I'm going out and I'm changing that hunger level. And I'm saying, okay, add, add 10 to the hunger level, or I guess I'd be subtracting 10. But in, in whatever, in whatever way I've got it set, I can go in and I can say, um, I'm going to change the food level by a certain amount so that now something is different. I've just changed the state of the object. So anything I'm doing where I give it information and I tell it to change something about itself, those are mutators. It's now not as hungry as it was before because I just gave it a value that represented some amount of food. Um, so really, I guess, I guess the best way to come up with an analogy, um, an accessor would be a question. It's anything I'm asking about itself, but it's not actually changing anything. And a mutator would be any method where I'm changing some property that's out there. Maybe I'm changing its hunger level. Maybe I'm changing its location. Maybe I'm changing um, its name um, or its age or anything like that. Um, an accessor would just be where I ask it a question about itself. Does that help? Yes, sir. Okay, and Renee just posted something out there. Um, have birthday is a mutator, get age is an accessor. Um, so yeah, I, I see where you're going with that. If I'm asking it, it's an a asking an object its age, that's an accessor. Um, if I tell it to have a birthday, um, something like that, then I'm changing what its age is. If I say, okay, you have now had a birthday, add one to your age, then that's a that's a mutator method. So yeah, good example. Okay, so let's see, I'm gonna switch screens and I'm gonna jump over to my JGrasp screen. I've got too many things open. I'm having a hard time finding the screens I want. Okay, so hopefully everybody's seen my JGrasp screen right now. Yes, sir. Everybody got it? Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a rubber duck class. Now, um, anybody know what I mean when I say rubber duck programming? Has anybody ever heard that term or do you use that in your classrooms by any chance? Is it like a little kid thing? Like, how should I say it? Like you know, beginning, 
Oh, I saw those before. Are they from like this one uh, company that sells them? Yeah. Is it like the exercising thing from middle school? Uh, no, it's not the exercising thing from middle school. Um, let me let me give you a little background on rubber duck programming. And I, I kind of started doing this a few years ago um, at the AP reading. There was another teacher that was sharing this idea of rubber duck programming. And the idea of rubber duck programming, the teachers in the room will commiserate to this. We've all had situations where we've been in the lab and maybe you have six hands that are up at the same time because you have six students that have questions and you're trying to work your way around the room and almost every student when you get to them and you say okay what's the problem what's going on what can I help you with the student will say well I've got this problem I've got this error that's popping up in my code and as they start walking through they say you know I initialize the variable here and then I work my way down and as they're describing the error they go oh, there it is. I didn't add one when I was supposed to add one. So really the teacher didn't need to be there. The teacher didn't answer the question. All the student needed to do was work through and kind of talk through their code. Okay, well, that's the idea of rubber duck programming. And I started doing this a couple of years ago. I go out to, um, I think it's the Oriental Trading Company and I'll buy a bag of these rubber ducks for like 10 bucks. Um, and then I, I give every student the opportunity to pick their duck and all of the ducks have little costumes and things like that. Um, for the teachers, by the way, if you plan to do this, make sure you get ducks that don't have squeakers. I made that mistake once. Um, and the last thing you want is a classroom full of ducks that when you squeeze them, they squeak. So these ducks don't squeak, but every duck gets, every student gets to pick their own personal duck. Um, and then the idea is that when a student has a question, if there's an error, if there's something that's not working right, the first person they talk to is maybe their partner and their partner kind of looks over and says, oh yeah, you didn't add one to the variable. If the partner's not available, then they talk to their duck. And nine times out of 10, I know it sounds goofy. I know it sounds silly, but nine times out of 10, just in talking and explaining the problem to their duck, their duck will help them figure out where the problem is because as they're working through, they'll, they'll find it on their own, which means now the teacher has more time to kind of circulate and, and hit the little tougher problems that are like logic errors and things like that. So funny story we had parent teacher conferences a couple years ago and I had you know several ducks sitting up on my desk and a parent came in and made a comment about them so I started to explain all this and she said no you don't have to explain she said I'm a I'm a full-time professional programmer she said I do system development she said I've got a duck sitting on my desk and she said my colleagues laugh at me because occasionally I talk to my ducks so so it is actually a thing I mean people people actually use this and it and it does work so so that's where rubber duck uh, programming comes from we're going to start by creating a rubber duck class Okay, so um, one of the things that I encourage, well, I don't encourage, I require them to do it um, in both my intro class and my AP class is I, I force my students to document their code. Um, so the main things that I, I require that they put in is just the programmer's name, the date, and the purpose. Um, not because it's part of the AP subset, not because it's part of anything that's going to be um, covered on the exam, but just because it's good programming practice. And one of the things I try and... Um, try and convince my students of is that there's more to Java programming than just the AP subset. You know, I, I'm assuming they're going to go on, they're going to take college level, college level classes, they might even go on and do this as a career. Um, so I'm trying to teach them good programming skills, not just the things that they're going to be tested on. Um, and one of those things that was kind of instilled upon me my freshman year in college from Dr. Fisher in our COBOL class was the need to document your code. You know, we want well-written, well-documented code so that the person that comes along to take over our code after us in the real world um, can actually read it and, and know what it is that they're doing. So um, the, the main things I require from my students when we do documentation is just the name, the date, and the purpose, and then any comments they would need to add through the program so that so that as we work through um, as we work through different things, their code is kind of self-documented and we can kind of see what things are, are going on in there. So, so with this one, um, let's see, the purpose is going to be simulate, simulate a rubber duck. Now, my problem is I can't multitask. I can't talk and type at the same time. So, um, so as we create our rubber duck class, So here's our class header. Okay, um, the first thing we need to do is we need to define what the instance variables of our class are going to be. What are the properties of our rubber duck? What are the things that our rubber duck is probably going to want to know about itself? What it's instance. made of. Variables. Okay. Okay, so let's do a string variable. Um, let's see, material. Now, um, uh, Mahmoud, I think you were the one that brought up uh, the the um, the concept of public versus private, right? Yes, sir. 
Okay, so this is where we need to talk about public versus private. Um, when we start defining things within a class, we have to talk about whether we want other objects to have access to it. You know, I don't want, if, if I'm working on a program that's going to have several different objects working together, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm designing some bath time program for kids. So I'm going to have a rubber duck, duck object. I'm going to have um, a sponge object. I'm going to have bubble bath as an object. Um, I'm going to have some other bath toys as individual objects. I don't want those objects to have access to change the material of my duck, right? I don't want them to change my duck from a rubber duck to a wood duck or a, um, you know, metal duck or whatever. So, so I want to make anything that is off limits to all of those other objects. I want to make them private so that oh, they're only available within the rubber duck class. Okay, so anything that is off limits becomes private. Um, the other reason we want to do that is we want to build some security into this stuff so that um, there, there might be some magical bath time being that's able to go in and change the contents of our duck, you know, if our program is going to allow that. So we want to build some security in, and that's where we're going to have our behavior set up so that if I go in and I, I call a specific method, which is public, and then I identify myself as, as an object that has access to change these things, then, okay, we can change it, but we can control all that from within a method that's public. You know, maybe we have to put in a pin number or a password or something like that to prove who we are to be able to change this stuff. But without having access to that, as long as things are private, it can only be changed internally through a specific method. So, so all of our instance variables are going to be private. Um, and this is usually where one of my students will say, okay, so that means that forever and ever, always, every time we create a class, 100% of the time, instance variables are private. Never any absolutes. I mean, there might be a specific, specific reason where we would want an instance variable to be public. Um, but typically, it's going to be something where maybe we've got it locked down um, that a variable is never going to change. Maybe I create a public instance variable called now, I know this is kind of a silly example because it's already available in the math class, but maybe I create a variable called pi where I set it up as a constant and I say pi equals 3.14. Okay, so there's no real no real need to ask my rubber duck object to tell me pi. That one I could, I could access directly. Um, if there's something specific about our rubber duck that we would want to make available to everybody that we don't care, then okay, that's, that's great. We can make that public. But I'm going to say that at least nine times out of 10, instance variables are going to be private and um, the behavior, the methods that we're going to create are going to be public. And, and again, that's not an absolute with the, be the behavior either. There might be a specific method that we want to be private. Maybe it's a helper method that's only available inside the class. But, but nine times out of 10, that's going to be kind of our general rule of thumb. Instance variables are private, methods are public. Okay. Um, what are some other things that we would need to know about our rubber duck? And I've got several different rubber duck examples here. I've got my beach duck that has a beach ball. Um, I've got my rainy day duck that's wearing um, a raincoat with an umbrella. Um, I've got the um, fairy godmother duck that has a magic wand. The kids are, the, the kids seem to like like the firefighter duck. The, um, there, there are a couple of ducks that are like soldier ducks that are wearing camo. Those are all gone. I don't have those anymore. Here's a construction duck that has a, a shovel. Um, I think those what are really it? the only ones I have left. What is its job? What is its job? Okay, private ring job. Um, we probably ought to give it a name. Uh, let's do one more. How about um, private int, we'll just say age. That's kind of a good one to work off of. Okay, so we've got four instance variables out there. Um, and right now they're all empty. Um, so we, we need a constructor. We need something so that if I create a rubber duck object or I create an instance, um, we didn't talk about this term. Um, there's a term that goes with this. Um, when we construct an object from a class, that, that term is called instantiation. I'm creating an instance of the class. So an object is always considered an instance of the class and that process is called instantiation. Um, one of the things I do with my students is I tell them on day one, when we first start working through things, I tell them to set aside one page in their notebook where they take notes and write dictionary at the top um, or, or definitions or something. So as we come up with all these terms, instantiation, um, instance, polymorphism, all these, all these weird terms, concatenation, all these weird terms that pop up throughout our class, they can write it in there and then write the little definition beside it. So instantiation is the process of creating an object from a class, okay? 
um, we're creating an instance. So, and again, that's kind of where the term instance variables come from. These are the variables that belong to the instance of this class. Okay. Well, now when we go through that process of instantiation, we need something that's going to give all of these instance variables a value. So this is where we're going to create our first constructor. Now, when we create a constructor, um, there are there are four parts to a typical method signature. Um, okay, pop quiz. Any of the students that are out there, anybody know what the four parts of a method signature are? Are they a uh, private class? And like you have to put uh, what its type is, like whether it's a string, int, and and then void. Is void part of it? Vo uh, void's part of it. I mean that's that's part of that return type. So it sounds like you've got you've got the main idea. Um, there are actually four parts. The first part is called the visibility modifier, and that's whether it's going to be public or private. So we want our constructor to be public. If we make the constructor private, then no other object anywhere in our in our project um, is going to be able to call the constructor to trigger this instantiation process. So we need the constructor to be public. Okay. Um, the second part of this is the return type. Okay. And that's where we get the string, the int, the void, all that kind of stuff. We have to know what it is that we're going to get back from our method when we when we tell it to do or ask it whatever it is we're telling it to do or whatever we're asking it. So again, kind of going back to that bank analogy, when I go in and I ask the bank teller object for a withdrawal, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, pardon me. When I tell the bank teller that I'd like to make a withdrawal, the return type is going to be the amount of money that I asked for. So that's my return type. If I go into the bank and I say I'd like to make a deposit, well, then the return type is going to be a receipt that shows, you know, what amount I've deposited into my account. Um, if I'm not going to get anything back, you know, then that would be where the return type would be void. So int string. Uh, double, Boolean, void. I mean, those are all different return types. That's what we can expect to get back when we when we call a method. Um, and by the way, it doesn't have to be a primitive data type. I can also say that I want the return type to be another rubber duck, or I, I want it to be, um, and I said strings in there. Strings aren't primitive data types. Those are objects. So I could, I could ask for a string back. I, I could ask for just about anything back um, as long as I've defined what it is and the primitives are already defined. Um, so the reason I bring that part up with constructors is one of the things that makes constructors a little different than the others is that constructors don't have a return type. There's nothing ever returned from a constructor. And that's one of the things that makes it a little different than the other methods. So a constructor only has three parts in its method header. Okay, the return type is not there. I don't even say void because that would imply that there has to be something returned or, or could be could be a possible return type. Constructors don't have a return type, so I don't even specify void. So those are the first two things in a method header. We've got um, the visibility modifier. We've got the return type. Well, the next thing we've got is the name. And one of the things that makes constructors a little different than the others is that the name of the constructor has to be a 100% identical match to the class. Okay, so it's case sensitive, spacing sensitive, um, spelling sensitive. The constructor has to match exactly what the name of the class is. So in this case, our constructor is going to be called Rubber Duck because that's the name of our class with a capital R and a capital D. And then the last part of the method signature is the parameter list. And that's what I have to give it in order to do its job, okay, the way I've specified. So again, kind of going back to that bank teller example, um, you know, I said if I walked into the bank and said I'd like to make a deposit, but then I stop talking at that point. Well, I haven't given the bank teller enough information. I haven't told them how much money I want to deposit. They need to know that. And I actually need to give them the money so that they can do their job and complete that instruction that I've given them. Well, in this case, for our default constructor, I'm going to put default constructor. What are the parentheses um, our, called again? I'm sorry? What are the parentheses called again? I was um, that's the parameter list. Here, let me put that in the comments here. So, um, so we've got visibility modifier. And I'll make sure this code, I'll, I'll pass this code off to Aaron so that he can add this to the um, out, out in the folder when we get done with all this. So the visibility modifier, the name, and the parameter list. Okay, and the parameter list is what it needs to do its job. Okay. And in this case, we're going to assume that I'm just going to make a default generic duck. Okay, so I'm going to go in. And I'm going to say um, we're going to set material equal to rubber because it's a rubber duck. <coughs> um, we're going to set its job 
equal to, I don't know, what would be a good default job? How about student? So by default, if I don't define a job for my duck, we're going to assume it's a student. Um, name is uh, Aaron. Aaron will be our default duck name. All right, and then we're going to start age at zero. Okay, so those are the default settings for just a default generic duck. Um, I don't know where my bag of rubber ducks is. I'll see if I can find just a generic default rubber duck. Oh, here's one. This will work. So um, bef before I found this version of rubber duck, I had little eraser ducks that I gave my students. So that's actually an eraser that they could take into the exam with them and use to erase. But then I couldn't find those anymore. So that's where I found these other sets of ducks. So we'll assume that that's our default generic duck. It's a rubber duck. Um, we're going to say it's a student duck, and its name is Aaron. And it has an age of zero. OK. Everybody OK with that? Yes, sir. OK, so let's do a second constructor. So um, have you heard the term overloading before? This would be another one that I would tell my students to put on that uh, definitions page. Making the thing, this, um, making like the rubber duck repeat itself? Uh, that's, that's a good guess, but not quite. I'm not necessarily making it repeat itself. Um, Overloading is a term that refers to methods. So I can overload a method, which means I can put in multiple methods that have the same name, but somehow I have to distinguish that it's different. Like if I create another rubber duck constructor, somehow I have to distinguish that it's different from the rubber duck constructor that I just did. So this is an overloaded constructor. Yeah, we, we had a comment that the, the same constructor with different parameters. Oh, perfect. Yeah, that's it. That's absolutely textbook definition. Perfect. Yeah, sorry, I'm not watching the chat. Um, so I'm going to do a second rubber duck constructor. And again, so I, I want it to be public. There's no return type for a, for a constructor. Got to make sure I'm watching my time. Ooh, we're down to 15 minutes left. OK. Um, so as I create my rubber duck constructor, I'm going to say that I'm going to give some parameters this time. So string. Um, See, that's where I run into trouble. We could do like an entire day on classes. Um, I'm going to do string m. I'm going to do string j, string n, and int a. OK, so my constructor for this one, we're going to say um, material equals a, um, job equals j, name equals n, and age equals a. OK. So. In a second, we're going to go out and we're going to, I've got this other little class kind of created off of the side that you might be able to see there called duck tester. We'll go in and we'll test these and make sure they work. Um, material should equal M. Ah, thank you. See, this is one of the things I like about doing live programming is it kind of shows that everybody makes little typos as they go. All right. Thank you uh, to whoever caught that. Um, is it Nick? Thanks, Nick, for catching that. Um, okay, so we need to add a couple of a couple of methods that will let us change some things. Okay, so um, so I'm going to add a getter method. Let's have half birthday. Do what? Half birthday. Half birthday. Okay. Um, well, okay. So we'll get to half birthday in a second when we um, when we get to uh, mutators. But at this point, all I'm going to do is ask it some questions about itself. So let's say I want to ask uh, what its job is. So public, um, and in this case, because I'm asking its job and job is a string, it's going to return a string back to me. So string uh, get job. I don't really need to give it any information as I'm telling it to do its job, or as I'm asking it's its job, because I'm asking it a question. So it doesn't need any information for me to do that. And really, all I'm going to do in here is I'm going to say, OK, return job. Take whatever the contents of that variable is and just return it back to me. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to do more, but I could do a getter for every single thing up there. I could I could get material, I could get name, I could get age. Um, actually, I will throw in a get age too, because we are going to do have birthday. So that'll make it easy to test that one. So if I'm asking it its age, I can I, I can ask it for an int because age is uh, age is an int. So I'm going to say get age. And again, because I'm asking it a question, I don't have to give it any information for it to give me that information back. I'm just going to ask it to return its age. OK, we also want to throw in a couple of mutator methods. Uh, let's see, setter, mutator. 
now I can't type. There we go. Um, so when I'm when I'm telling it something, I'm not necessarily going to wait for something to come back. So now this is where my return type is going to be void. And I'm going to tell it to set job. And in this case, I'm going to give it a new variable. Um, and I can also tell it um, have birthday. Um, and in this case, because all I'm doing is just telling it, okay, you've just had a birthday, I really don't need to give it any information. All I'm going to do is say age plus plus. Everybody okay with that? If somehow, um, if you wanted to like add two instead of one, how would you do that? If I wanted to add two instead of one, um, really there are a couple ways I could do it. I could say age equals age plus two, um, or I could say age plus equals two. Um, I could say age plus plus, and then immediately follow it with another age plus plus. So, I mean, really there are a lot of ways I could, I could add to probably the easiest, um, I'll put this one in here too, because these are probably the two easiest, um, would just be to say either age equals age plus two or age plus equals two. Both of those would work. Okay. Um, and one thing to remember, and I, I meant to point this out when we were up doing the constructor, always remember that the assignment operator works from right to left. One of the most common mistakes I see in my own classroom um, and as a reader is that I'll see students that will accidentally do this, m equals material, which will compile but it doesn't actually set the value of material to M. I create this variable called M. I take whatever's in the material bucket, my instance variable, and I assign it to M. And then because of the way the scope of the variables work, as soon as this constructor is done running, M goes away. M doesn't exist anymore, which means I haven't changed material. I only temporarily changed the parameter that I passed in um, and then it goes away. So I really didn't change anything by doing that. So be careful that when we assign things, we always assign from right to left, that's important. OK, um, OK, so um, I'm going to jump out and I'm going to go over to this duck tester that I created. Where's my duck tester? And I already kind of prepped this a little bit. Um, so this is the one. This is our client. This is the one that has the main method. Um, this is the one that's going to kind of control everything. And this is where we're going to come in and say, OK, we need to create an instance. Now that I've gone out and I've defined, well, let me compile and make sure I'm good here first. Now that I've created this blueprint of a duck, and we know what this blueprint looks like. We know what properties every rubber duck should have. We know what the behavior of a rubber duck is. We want to go out and we want to create this tester so we can make sure that everything works the way it's supposed to. I want to create some instances or instantiate some rubber ducks. So I'm going to create a rubber duck. Um, we'll call it um, duck1 equals new rubber duck. And I'm going to use the default constructor, which means I'm not going to tell it anything about this duck. Um, and then I'm going to go in and I'm going to ask it some questions. So I'm going to say system.out.println duck1. Dot, let's see, what did we have? We had get material and get age. OK, so when I run, it's going to construct a duck object for me. Oops, get material. What did I miss? Oh, sorry, get job. We did job, not material. Okay, so this would be the equivalent of me going into the bank and asking the bank teller for a cheeseburger and fries. I never defined what get material would mean. Um, so this is one of those points where I would tell the students, yeah, I did that on purpose because I wanted to demonstrate that point. Um, I, I didn't define what the behavior of get material would be. So this is the, the compiler looking at, looking at me going, I have no idea what you're asking me to do. I have no idea what get material means because I never defined that. So what this should do is it should construct a default rubber duck and it should come back and tell me that the material is rubber. Oh, student, I'm still thinking material. Um, so our default job for a duck is student. Um, if I go in and I ask this duck, get age, it should reply back with zero because that's the age of my default duck. Okay, now if I create another rubber duck, our second choice was to fill in all of these parameters. And I wanna look again, make sure I'm getting them, getting them in the right order. So we had material, job, name, and age. So let's say um, the material for this one is gonna be Teflon. I don't know why you would need a Teflon duck, but hey, why not? 
Um, the second one is job. So let's say the job for this duck is, um, let's see, we've got uh, construction. Oh, oh what were you have, gonna say? Go for it. You could have a Teflon duck for somebody who needs to cook. Okay, chef, I like that. Um, I need an, a name for our duck. Let's name it Alex. Alex, okay. And let's say the age is uh, 32. All right, so I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna ask duck two those same questions. System.out.println um, duck two get job. System.out.println duck two dot get age. My students laugh at me because I say what I'm typing as I'm typing it, so sorry about that. So now when I run the program, it should tell me the information I've asked about duck one, it should also tell me the information I've asked about duck two. So duck one is a student with age zero, duck two is a chef age 32. Okay, everybody got the idea? Questions at this point? Uh, looks like we're still doing okay time-wise. We've got about 10 minutes left in this session. Okay, no questions. There are so many other things we could get into with this. Um, tell you what, let's jump back. I'm gonna jump back to the PowerPoint at this point if nobody has questions. And we'll start wrapping this part of the session up. So I have some questions for you. So based on the information I've given you at this point, this is where we get into the little pop quiz. Um, if you go out and look at the handout that I gave, um, and I believe this is the first set of exercises that pops up in that, in that handout, the student handout. One of the first things that's there for exercise one is we have this dog class that's been defined. So you'll notice our dog class has two private instance variables, a name and an age. It has a constructor, which we can pass in an, a name and an age, the, the initial name and the initial age. And then we have a get name, we have a get age, we have a method called make older, and we have a two string method. And I should probably mention the two string method um, the way I define two string to my students is that the purpose of the two string method is to, to give us the state of the object. I mean, ideally, two string should, should tell us the contents of all of the instance variables. And you can do that in a lot of different ways. Notice in this way, they've used concatenation to actually make a little sentence out of it. Um, you know, I tell my students that, that you can define the two string method if your purpose is to use it for debugging so that while you're working, you can just say, hey, tell me everything that's in my instance variables at this point. You might format the output to look one way. If in this case, you want it to be something that the user has access to, maybe you're designing a game uh, like a role play game, like a Dungeons and Dragons type game where you have an elf or a wizard or a bard and you want to display all of the information about that character on the screen, you might format it a different way. You know, this is the name, this is the uh, this is this is their role, this is their health, this is their, um, I don't know, it's been a long time since I've played Dungeons and Dragons, their, their strength, um, their charisma, I mean, all these different things, you could have all of that built in there so that it kind of formats it in a nice way on the, sc on the screen. So what I'd like you to do is take a minute and look at the different, the different um, kind of categories over here on the left, and then we're going to work through them and we're going to see if we can identify where each of those things is in this class. Okay, so take a couple seconds, look them over, and I'll give you a, I'll give you a little extra information. There are three things in that list that aren't actually included in this class. Okay, so the first question: anybody know what the three things oh, sorry, are? Rob. Yeah, go ahead. I, th I think uh, you have a question. Someone's raising their hand in the chat. Oh, okay. Rana. Uh, Rana, am I saying that right? Yeah, this is Rai. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, what can I, I do for you? Ask, yeah, I would like to answer this question. Please. Oh, okay. Go for it. Thank you. So the class header is public class dog. Okay. Uh, the method uh, is the get name, get age. Okay. With the uh, constructor is public dog, which is the parameterized constructor, the one that receives uh, two parameters. Okay. And the uh, mutator method, which is the updating or modified method, which is a uh, public void uh, make older. Okay. And now the two, uh, what uh, still we have? Hala two string, it's uh, another type of methods. Uh, like what you explained just now, you can make more than one two string, or you can just, if you want to access all the, uh, the private instant variables, you can just, uh, you have a one two string. 
So I think it's a different type from the mutator and the uh, accessor method. That's it. Okay. Uh, and what else you have overloaded method? Uh, no, we don't have overloaded method because we don't have a method with the same name. Overriding methods, no, we don't have. I think we don't have, so that's it. Thank you. I hope I have, I'm correct. What do you yep, think? You are, you are correct. Thank you. Yeah. Overridden again. Okay, so overridden we never really talked about. Um, overridden normally comes up when we start um, getting into that, uh, I think it's unit 10 in the CED, when we start talking about inheritance. Um, uh, nine, when, Mr. Unit nine, inheritance. It's nine, thank you. Recursion is 10. I always switch those two because I teach them in reverse of each other. Um, so, so when we get to the unit on inheritance, overridden methods is when we put a method in a super class and then we overwrite it in the lower class. And that goes a little bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. But, um, but when you get to the point in your class that you're talking about inheritance, I can create a method in a super class. Let's say, um, let's say I, I create a dog class like this. I could have a method in here, um, get age, or, or let's say make older. And then I can create a hierarchy of dogs below that. So I might have, you know, a specific class called Chihuahua that's an extension of dog. And I could have a class called Great Dane that's an extension of dog. I could have a class called German Shepherd that's an extension of dog. So I could do really a subclass for each one of those. And maybe I have a, a breed of dog that ages a little faster or, you know, there's something about that dog that changes a little bit differently than the others. So I can override this method in the lower in the lower class in the subclass so that instead of doing the one that's general to all of the dogs that get shared with that specific type of dog it's going to run the lower method so those are what we think of when with overridden methods now technically and this is where we get really really technical um, you could also argue that the constructor and two string are both overridden methods but again that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about there is this overarching kind of omnipotent class that every single class we create automatically extends. We don't have to say that. Um, we don't have to specify that when we create our dog class, for example. And, and that kind of overriding class does technically con contains a constructor and it contains a two string method. So if by some chance I forget to put a constructor into my class or I forget to put that two string method in, it'll automatically go up to that overriding, you know, top of the hierarchy class and it'll pull those. Again, that's a little outside the scope of what we're talking about right now. So I don't really wanna confuse things by going too far into that. Um, if, if you're a Harry Potter fan, that's kind of like, well, it's not really the dark arts, but it's more, more advanced stuff that <laughs> might confuse things a little bit if we try and go there, if our goal is just to talk about basic classes at this point. Okay, so technically, there, there are overridden methods in here, the constructor and the two string method. Um, I'll be honest with you, if you forget to put in a constructor or a two string, the ones that are kind of inherited from up in that top level class are not very helpful. They don't do much. They basically just fill a void so that your code will still compile and it'll do something. Um, but they, they don't do anything super meaningful for us. Um, we don't have any constants in here. There's nothing in here that we're defining as a constant. Um, and you are absolutely right. There's nothing in here that's being defined as an overloaded method. We don't have any methods that have the same name. So I've also had some, I've also had some that have argued that because two strings purpose is to tell us about the specific object, it's, it's literally telling us the state of the object, that it could be considered an accessor. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that one either way. Um, let's see. Yeah, so um, I'm looking at the comments. Rob, you caught me when you said technically two string is an overridden method. So yeah, I agree with you 100%. Um, technically two string and the constructor. Um, again, if we wanna get super technical, the constructor is is up in that that class. We, we call upon it, but we don't necessarily override and we get really, really technical at that point. But um, but but at, at this point, um, that's, that's pretty much everything we have about classes. Um, we have a little more time. Well, it is actually 11 o'clock. We're at the end of our hour and I wanted to make sure to allow a little time before we get into a race. So, um, man, like I said, we could spend, we could spend two days, like two full days talking about all the nuances of classes and methods and all that good stuff. Um, I was hoping we'd have a little more time to get into, to get into some things, but our time went really fast. So are there any other questions um, before we move on and we'll, we'll take a little break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about some basics about arrays. Um, but any other questions about classes um, for either the teachers or the students that we can get into at this point? I was gonna tell you, thank you. Uh, you have clarified the classes uh, for me. 
well. Oh, enough. good. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad it was helpful. And you're a great teacher. Mr. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. That's nice to hear. Me too. The same, um, uh, the same thing. Thank you, Mr. Oh, absolutely. Anytime. Okay. If there are no questions, I'll tell you what. Let's take five minutes or so. It's 11 o'clock Eastern time on the dot. Um, I'm going to run and refill my coffee quick. Um, let's let's plan to come back in five minutes at like 11:05, and then we'll start in. We'll we'll talk a little bit about um, we'll talk about a raise for an hour or so. Okay. Right. You let's good. Get off the if, Zoom. Um, anyone else has questions that you think of over the break? Put those in the chat, and we'll address those right at the top uh, before we start in with the next. Topic. Absolutely. Do you want us to right. leave the Zoom and then come back? Oh, no, 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 don't, don't, you don't have to leave the Zoom. Just if anybody needs to run to the restroom or grab a glass of water, anything like that. Like I said, I'm going to run and uh, actually, I think I've still got coffee in my mug. So I think I'm okay. So, um, so I'm just going to shift over PowerPoints and, and kind of prep for, for round two here. Okay. But no, you don't have to leave the Zoom. You're, you're perfectly fine. Just stay put. Yep. Just sit tight. We'll, we'll pick back up here in about four minutes. Okay. Let's see. Mr. Schultz, so tell me, are you, do you live in Kentucky or like, do you commute to Kentucky or something? I, I don't. I actually teach in Bellbrook, Ohio, which is just outside of Dayton, Ohio. Um, so where, where are you in Kentucky? I'm in Lexington. In Lexington. The, the okay. Great, the, the great uh, capital of the world. <laughs> I, I am probably about, I would guess two hours from you. Um, I read see. in a textbook that Dayton used to be a place where a lot of people would uh, illegally make alcohol, and so it was like the moon, uh, the moonshine ca crime of the capital of the world. <laughs> really, I I had never heard that before. It wouldn't surprise me, but um, but I hadn't heard that. That's that's not one of Dayton's claim to fame claims to fame that I knew about. Doesn't I? It, I it like I said, it doesn't surprise me, but. I always kind of assumed that, uh, but but again, I grew up watching shows like The Dukes of Hazard and that kind of stuff. So I always I always assumed that like Hazard, Kentucky, and and places like that were you know the the kind of the um, the Appalachian area of Kentucky that was the moonshine capital. But it's more like the coal capital. Oh, okay. Because even though the coal industry is declining very quickly there. Yeah. There we go. So what year are you in school? I'm a senior. You're a senior. Okay. So what's coming next year? What What are your plans? I'm going to go to UK and hopefully major in STEM. Oh, nice. All right. And, and computer science is going to be helpful on many levels uh, if I get into research because I need to deal with like uh, information storage. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, I tell... I, I, for a while, I'm right now I'm at the point where I'm teaching all computer science, but for a while I was also teaching. Uh, so before we start, any questions that popped up in the last 10 minutes or so from, um, from the classes discussion, any last second things we can cover before we hit a raise? Okay, so let's dive into a race. So I wanna do the same thing. I wanna give um, the students that, that are in the meeting um, just a couple minutes to unmute and and tell me a little bit about what you know, a know about a raise at this point, just so I know kind of where our basis is of where to start. I mean, we're, we're still gonna cover the basics, but that way it'll give me a little focus on how much time to spend on certain things. Uh, I have no idea how to rearrange an array from like increasing to decreasing or decreasing to, uh, to increasing order. Okay. But I do know that arrays are like some sort of um, long structure that contains several components. What are, I forgot what the components were called. Okay, we'll make sure we hit all that. Anybody else want to jump in? I'm looking at the chat here too. Okay, I'm not getting much else. Uh, here we go. Arrays hold a lot of numbers, I guess. Okay, that is absolutely right. Arrays can hold numbers, but arrays can hold more than numbers too. Um, so I'll make sure we focus on that part. But you're absolutely right that the whole purpose of arrays is to hold a lot of something. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so let's let's jump in. So first off, let me jump back over here. Here we go. Um, imagine, and I apologize for these slides. I realized as I was looking at my slides this morning that when I put these together, I put a lot of information on each one of these slides. So so I need to go back and I need to retool these at some point. But um, but I'll kind of walk us walk us through them. So imagine we have a program that we use to maintain information about a set of integers and that at this point in our program we only have three different numbers we need to keep track of so it wouldn't really be difficult to go out and create three variables you know int data one int data two and int data three so now imagine that again this is a real world type thing where our boss comes to us and says okay we need to expand to this program there are now 10 values we need to keep track of well i could add seven more data elements but the more I add, the more tedious it gets to try and keep track of all of this stuff, okay? So then imagine the boss comes back and says, okay, we're gonna really expand this thing. We now have 100 different data points that we need to keep track of. So if I keep following kind of the same model, I would have to go out and I would have to manually create 100 individual variables, or let's say the boss came back and said, we now have a thousand data elements, okay? I could still do that, but it would be really, really inefficient and it would be really, 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 really difficult to maintain using individual variables. So this is where arrays come in. Arrays are considered a data collection. And if you think about what that term means, a collection means a group of things, okay? So instead of coding 100 individual variables, I would go to this first blue line and say, okay, I'm gonna create a collection that will hold 100 elements. Now, the way I tell my students when we're like day five and we first start talking about how we create a primitive variable and what a variable is i tell them in their mind to visualize every time we create a variable it's a bucket so an int bucket is big enough to contain four bytes a double bucket is big enough to contain eight bytes so we're actually picturing sizes and things and that helps us to to try and keep keep track of the fact that okay i can pour an int into a double bucket because i'm pouring four bytes into an eight byte bucket um, i can't pour a double into an int because i can't fit eight bytes into a four byte bucket so that's why that kind of kind of thing works but when i create an array with 100 elements, that's basically me making a big line of 100 buckets and putting a number on the front of each one. So now I can identify which bucket I wanna put information in. So really creating an int array um, called data that contains 100 elements is no different than me doing that whole thing where I have int data one, int data two, int data three, all the way to int data 100. I would have 100 buckets um, and I'm just putting them all in a line so that I can access them by referencing their number instead of a specific variable name. Okay, so that well, line is equivalent to creating 100 individual variables. I heard a question pop up. Yes, but won't you have to restructure your program in order for you to instead put like the ends of like maybe int three, int one, int two, or something like that? Yeah, I, I would. So instead of having, you know, data one and data two, data three, I would have to go out and I would have to reference those specific variables by their index position in here. So here, I'll show you. Um, so just real quick to make the point, if I wanted to expand this, so the nice thing is now if my boss comes back and says, hey, we need to go from 100 data elements to 1000 data elements, all I have to do is just go in and add a zero at the end of this thing. And now I've expanded this line of buckets. So I have 1000 of them lined up instead of 100. But um, to get what you're to get to what you're saying, um, well, well, first off, I'm going to ask you to hold that thought for just a second. Um, I can create arrays for any primitive data type. So I could create an array of doubles. I could create an array of booleans. I could create an array of characters. I could also create an array of objects you know if i have a student object that i've defined you know we just talked about classes if i create a student class i could create an array of student objects i could create an array of rectangle objects i could now after what we just did i could go out and create an array of rubber duck objects and we could do that here in a couple minutes if we have time okay but but to get to what you're talking about when i reference something i reference it by its index position <coughs> so when we talk about an array the first thing we need to know is that an array is an object, just like any other object. I have to reference it using a reference variable. So if I want to go in and I want to do something with the value at position four, I would go in and say, okay, I'm going to go into the array that I've titled my ints, which has 17 values. And I would say, I want to go to the, um, the, the value that's at position four, and I want to set that value, just like I would say, you know, data four equals 21, I could say, okay, go to the collection called my ints, go to the position labeled position four and set that value to 21. So a 21 goes into that spot. The other thing I wanna point out 
And this is one of those questions that if I ever had the chance to sit down and have lunch with James Gosling, I've, I've got a little set of questions that if that that opportunity would ever present itself, James Gosling was the leader of the team that created Java. Um, and he's still out there doing things. He has different jobs and he goes to conferences and you still see him out and about sometimes. If by some chance I ever have that celebrity moment where I get to spend lunch with James Gosling, I've got this set of questions in my head. One of them would be, why do we start our index positions at zero? Other languages start at one. If you're taking AP Computer Science principles and you're looking at lists, in AP Computer Science principles, the first index position of a list is position one. But specifically in Java and like Python, when we create a list, which you know, arrays are considered um, a, a data collection, we always start the index position at zero. So if I have 17 elements that I've created in my, in my array, they're numbered from zero to 16. And I would love to get the reason for that. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of reasons and I could go out and look it up, but um, you know, I, I kind of look at it as one of those things that, okay, I'm just gonna accept it as zero, but that would be one of the things I would love to hear from James Gosling himself. What was the reasoning behind that? Um, so we have to keep in mind that if I have 17 elements, they start numbering at zero and they end one number before whatever the size of the array is. So we have to kind of be careful about that. Okay, um, but at any point I can go to any element in that array given its index position and I can set the value. I can also go out and I can get whatever value is in that bucket. If I wanna display whatever is at position seven, so whatever would be in that spot, I can just say system.printline my ins index position seven and it'll take whatever's in that position um, and, it, and it'll display it to the screen for me, okay? Um, we are also, allowed to use them just like I would use any other variable. So just like I could say x equals three times math.py, I can say, okay, let's take three times math.py and store that value in index position seven of my ints. I can say, let's take whatever values in position seven, multiply it by two, and then take that product and store it in position four. Um, so as you see here, we can take we can take values out of the array. I mean, again, these are these are no different than any other variable. I just have to identify the collection that I'm pulling them from and the index position, either when I set them or when I get information from them. Okay. Questions at this point? Okay, so one of the things that, that we need to talk about is array traversals. Um, I can reference arrays inside loops. And if you look at, um, if you have access to the CED, so this is probably more for the teachers than the students, although the students, you guys have access to the CED out on College Board's website. If you look at topic 6.4, which is developing algorithms using arrays, that's where one of the essential non knowledge statements, um, I'm looking at it right here, I'm kind of looking down at it. It has a list of all of the different little algorithms that you would use array traversals for. So for the students that are in the meeting, um, Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say an array traversal? What do you think it means if I say array traversal? Does that mean putting the array in order? Um, it could. Um, one of the things I could do within an array traversal is I could sort it or I could move the values around. So that's a good guess. Uh, uh, array traversal means uh, since we don't start from index zero to into the index, uh, for example, x uh, dot length minus one, no, we will start from uh, x dot length minus one, yani from the last index in the array to the first index of the array, like this. And yani instead to start the array from the beginning, from the first index, we will start the array from the last index. Okay. Um, actually, you're, you're right. Um, we could traverse the array from the back to the front. We could go from the last index position to the first, but, but technically we could traverse from the front to the back too. <laughs> when I um, when we talk about array traversal, really all that means is I give some starting value and some ending value, and then I access all of the elements between those two values for some specific purpose. So my purpose could be to go from index position zero all the way up to the last index position to look for whatever the smallest value is. It could be that I wanna start at the last index position and end when I get to zero, um, and I wanna swap every value as I go. Okay, um, it could be that I want to start at index position 10 and I only want to go as far as index position 20. And maybe I want to see what the largest value is between those two index positions. So, so when we talk about traversals, 
really everything that that I heard you saying was was correct, but it expands a little bit beyond that. An array traversal means that I'm going from some starting point to some ending point, and I'm accessing all of the values in the array between those two points for some purpose. And like I said, if you um, if you look, it's page 116 of the CED. Those include like determining, I'll pull it up here so I'm not looking over my shoulder at you. Um, it includes determining a minimum or maximum value, computing the sum, the average, the mode, um, determining if at least, at least one element has a particular property. And I mean, this list kind of goes on and on and on. But, um, but for all of those things, we need to kind of progress from one index to the next index position as we go. So because we're looking for something or we're setting something. So in these examples, I've got two different examples of an array traversal. Universal. You know, the first one, I'm saying that we have an array that has 10 elements. I'm going to go from array position, from index position zero up to, but not including 10. Um, I don't want to actually include 10 because then I'd go out of bounds because remember they're numbered from zero to nine. And all I'm doing is I'm using this example of an array traversal to set every value in my array. I'm taking whatever this loop control variable is and I'm setting my loop control variable I'm doubling it and then setting that position. So zero will end up with a value of zero. One uh, index position one will have a value of two. Index position two will have a value of four and so on and so on and so on. And then I've got another array traversal where I'm starting at position nine, my last index position. I'm going forward in the array to the front all the way and all the way down to zero. And I'm having it display what those values are. So I'm basically saying, okay, tell me what's in index position nine. Okay, now tell me what's in index position eight. Now tell me what's in index position seven. So these are two, two examples of array traversals. One of them going from zero to nine. The other one I'm going from nine back to zero again, but I'm doing two different things with them. One of them I'm using to set the value in the array, uh, set the values. And then the other one I'm using it to just check and see what those values are. Okay, everybody okay with that? Yes. Uh, pausing for questions. Okay. Um, all right. So here's a little example. Um, let's let's do an example, and then we'll go back and we'll kind of go back into JGrasp and we'll play with some arrays. Um, we'll kind of do some different things in there. So so here I have an example where again I have two different um, examples in an array traversal. I'm creating this array called my sample that's going to have ten elements in it. Um, and notice I'm doing something a little different. Um, you know, again, we want to have the flexibility to be able to go out and change this number whenever we want. So if I hard code the number 10 in here, and this is one of the things I have to go over with my students over and over and over again, because they like to hard code numbers. I know that this array is going to have 10 elements. So it would be perfectly fine for me to say that I want to go from zero up to, as long as my loop control variable stays below 10, I know I'm not going to go out of bounds. But I want to have the flexibility to be able to go back and change this and not have to change it in a lot of different spots. So instead of saying 10 in this spot, I'm going to say, OK, go up to but not including whatever the length of my sample is. And that way, if I decide, OK, I want to go back in and change this to 20 or I want to change this to 200 or I want to change this to 100,000, I don't have to go in every time and change these values either. I know that no matter what I change this to, it's automatically going to go up to whatever the length of my array is. So that way I can make one change to define what the size of my array is. And then I don't have to change anything else. I know everything's going to work the way it's supposed to. OK, so take a couple seconds and, and, and look at this. Um, and specifically for the students, I want to know if you can tell me what the output of this is going to be. This is a little test for modulo too. So I'll give you about 30 more seconds and hopefully by then you'll, you'll have figured out what the pattern is. OK, anybody have any guesses as to what the output of this little program is going to be? Uh, let's see. 
good guess. I see one out in the chat. Would it just be five a bunch of times? Not quite. Um, anybody else have a guess? Um, more uh, reminder. Yeah, it's a reminder. Uh, can I replay? It's five one two zero one two three four zero. Uh, you're close. You're close. So the trick with this one, um, I, I've got this, I've got this little variable that I use and it pops up in my slides and my students just start giving me grief about it. And again, this is something I think I picked up from a college professor. I always, for whatever use and reason, use LCV as my loop control variable. And I think a, a college professor or something got me in the habit of that. But so as we work our way through this thing, the very first thing we do is we set our loop control variable equal to zero. And then we're going to come down and we're going to say, okay, take zero modulo five, which is going to give us remainder. And if you think about that, if I take zero divided by five, five goes into zero, zero times, and I get a remainder of zero. So zero modulo five gives us zero, which means I'm going to set my array index position zero equal to zero. And then I'm going to loop back up and I'm going to increment my loop control variable to one. Okay. And because I'm taking one modulo five, one, one divided by five is going to give me a remainder of one. So I'm setting index position one equal to one. And that pattern is going to kind of repeat itself. If I set my loop control variable equal to two as I work my way through, um, two modulo five gives me two, and then three modulo five gives me three, four modulo five gives me four. But then as soon as my loop control variable hits five, well, five modulo five is going to be zero because five is divisible by five. So things kind of reset at that point. So starting at index position five, index position five is gonna be set equal to zero. If I take LCV equal to six, six modulo five is gonna equal uh -huh. one, which means position six in my array is gonna have a value of one. Position seven is gonna have a value of two. So really, as I work my way through this thing, what's gonna happen is position zero will be zero, one will be one, two will be two, and I'll end up with the contents of the array being zero, one, two, three, four, zero, one, two, three, four. And, and that pattern just kind of repeats. And I could make this bigger if I wanted, I could do up to a hundred or a thousand. And that pattern of modulo five is still gonna repeat because I can never have a remainder greater than four if I'm dividing by five. So it's always gonna be zero, one, two, three, four, zero, one, two, three, four, zero, one, two, three, four. And then when I come down into the second traversal, what this one's asking me to do is to go from zero all the way through the array, tell me what the index position is, and then tell me what value goes with it. So I would have 0 0, 1 1, 2 2, 3 3, 4 4, 5 5. Uh, I'm sorry, 5 0, 6 1, 7 2, and so on, so on, so on. Okay. Everybody okay with all that? So now I have now I have a couple of questions about this. So um, and we've already kind of talked through some of these, but so what is the size of the array? We'll, we'll go through a couple of the basics before we jump over and we start doing some coding. 10, perfect. So the size, I see that pop up in the chat. Um, so the, the um, size of my array is 10. Um, what's the index position of the first element in the array? Awesome, I got zero. What's the um, index of the last element in the array? Awesome. You guys are doing great. I'm watching the chat. I'm watching these answers pop up. Um, so now imagine I go out and change the code so that in that very first line up here at the top, I change the one, uh, the 10 to 100. Okay. So now what's the index of the last element in the array? 99. You guys are good. You guys have this. Okay. And we already talked about this one a little bit. The benefit of using my sample dot length um, as opposed to just hard coding, whatever the, the length of my array is, is now that I can go in and I can freely change the size, whatever I want, and I don't have to change other things. And as, as programmers, I jokingly tell my programmers that we, that uh, are my students, that we as programmers are lazy people. You know, our goal is to, the purpose we write programs is to make things faster and easier for ourselves. I can go out and do 10,000 calculations in a matter of minutes as opposed to doing them all by hand. So um, one of the things that we like to do is when we make a change to a program, we want to write our code in such a way that I don't have to make extra changes to accommodate one little change up here. And this is one of the ways we do that. So so the benefit of using my sample.length is that I don't have to go through and make other changes to my code um, if by some chance the size of my array changes. Okay, so let's jump over. Um, we'll come back and we'll come back in a second and talk about the difference between for loops and enhanced for loops. I'm going to jump back to, uh, where do I want to be? Over here. Okay. And um, I'm going to close up my duck tester stuff. We'll come back to that in a second, maybe. 
And instead, I've got this little class started called array demo that I already kind of built the shell in. So with this one, um, I've got I've got my purpose set up to demonstrate array creation and array, and I can't spell array, array traversals. Um, we're going to use the scanner class a little bit, maybe, so we'll be able to ask the user to type some things in. So at this point, what I want to do is I want to create an array of integers that can hold 10 elements. So int uh, my demo array. And I forgot the brackets. Um, and we're going to make it a new array of ints. And I said I wanted it to have 10 elements. OK, so there are a lot of different ways we could fill this thing. I mean, we could do it with an array traversal. Is, is everybody seeing my Java screen, by the way? I've done that before where I think I've switched screens and then I talk for 15 minutes and realize nobody can see what I'm talking about. Um, OK, so a lot of different ways we could do this. We can create an array and we can set up a little for loop to traverse the array and give it some value. So for um, int, and again, this is where I have a habit of using LCV for my loop control variable. Um, my demo array dot length. Now, we talked about the fact that an array is an object. And because it's an object, it has behavior. There are certain things we can ask our array. And one of the things we can ask our array is its length. So I can say that I want uh, my demo array dot length. Um, and in this case, with arrays, length is stored as a, a property. Um, it, this is one of those cases where I, I don't have to put parentheses behind it because it's actually stored within an array object as a variable. So one of the things that gets confusing is the fact that if I ask a string its length, that's a method. I have to put parentheses. If I ask an array its length, <clears throat> I don't because an array stores length as a property. And that's another one of those things that I would ask Mr. Gosling, you know, why didn't you make those consistent? That would have been so much easier. Um, so we're going to traverse the entire array and I'm just going to tell it to plug in a random value. Um, so let's see, we'll do my demo array LCV and we'll just tell it to give us a random integer uh, math.random between 0 and 10. Now, we probably need to just take a quick second and, and review a little bit how math.random works, okay? Because math.random is one of those things that, that is part of the AP subset. And so there will be questions about that, okay? So remember that math.random will give us a random decimal value, a random double between zero and one, inclusive to the zero, but not inclusive to the one. So in other words, I could get anything from zero up to 0.9999999, okay? Those will be values that I'll get back. If I wanna get an integer, <clears throat> okay, I have to at some point cast that as an integer, but I have to make sure I cast it appropriately. So if I forget this set of parentheses, the way this is going to cast is it's going to take that random value between 0 and 0 0.99999, and it's going to cast it first, because casting comes before multiplication in our kind of precedence level of how all this stuff happens, which means math.random converted to an int will always be 0. And then if I take zero and multiply by 10, I'm always going to get zero. So if I if I run this program as is right now, I'm basically going to get 10 elements and they're all going to be set equal to zero. So I have to make sure that I take that random value, zero to 0 0.9999999 and multiply by 10 first, which means now I'm looking at values from zero up to 9.99999. And then I can cast and it's going to eliminate any decimal values. So I'm going to get a random integer that's going to be an integer between zero and nine every time. And if I wanted to adjust what the minimum value is, if I wanted this to go from one to 10, I could just add one and, and things like that. So, um, so if you're not comfortable with random, I don't want to burn a lot of our array time talking about math.random, but go back and review. Um, and this is where I'll put in a little plug for some of the AP Live videos that are still out there and some of the AP Daily video videos that are in AP Classroom. Um, I, I had the opportunity to work with a group of teachers to do those AP Daily videos, and it was an amazing group of people to work with. Um, any of those videos that are out there in any of those contexts and any of the units are fantastic to go back and look at. Um, and I know back in the unit two videos, there's one specifically that deals with the math class and math.random. So take advantage of those. Um, they're a great resource to go back and get little refreshers on things like how math.random works and how array traversals work and all that good stuff. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to set up one more little array traversal just down here so that we can test and look at what the contents of our array is. So int lcv equals zero. My demo array dot length. And so we're just going to do system.out.print. Um, let's see, 
and a space afterwards. And OK, so let's see if this worked. Where are my typos? I always make typos. Oh, none this time. OK, so we got our array of random numbers. And you'll notice that every time I run this, it's going to give me a different set of random numbers. OK, everybody good with that? Now, if I wanted to change this, um, again, because I use this my demo array dot length, if I decide, you know what, I want 20 values instead of 10, all I have to do is change the size of my array. Now it's going to work through all 20 elements, give them a random number, and then it's going to go back and it's going to display all 20. If I say, eh, that's too many, I only want five. Oops, wrong spot. Then I can go back and change. OK, and there's one thing you have to be careful about. Um, we get into this habit where we want to do something like this, where I want to use less than or equal to. OK, well, again, this is where you have to think about and, and we have to be clear about how arrays are defined. If I say that I've got five elements, OK, and I tell it that I want to go up to including the length, that means what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and eventually I'm going to hit 5 because it's going to say as long as I'm less than or equal to my length, it's OK to go through this loop. If we do that, we're going to get what's called an index out of bounds exception. It means I'm trying to <laughs> reference an index position that's not there anymore. Yeah, question. No, thank you. I'm just saying it will have a, we'll have it out of bounds. So I'm yes. Error, yeah. we supposed to add minus one. Yani, my yeah, so minus one. Yeah, so we could absolutely do that. We could restructure kind of the logic of our of our condition and say, okay, if I like using less than or equal, I just have to keep in mind that I have to stop one before I get the length. So, so it would be perfectly fine to say loop control variable is less than or equal to whatever the length minus one would be. And that way I'm still okay. So yeah, that's perfectly fine. That's a great way to approach that. Um, but it's something that, again, I kind of wanted to throw out to caution. It, make sure it's one way or the other. We either do less than the length, or we do less than or equal to length dot one. Uh, I'm sorry, length minus one. Um, because on most of the free response questions, spe specifically the ones where we're doing dealing with arrays, array lists, or 2D arrays, there will be a part of that problem where you have to do an array traversal. And that'll be one of the points of every free response question is worth nine points. And that'll be connected to one of the points. Do we know how to set up a for loop to go through a specific part of the array without going one over or being one short, something like that? So, so I have to be careful that if I'm using uh, my demo array dot length minus one, that I don't do less than. Because if I do less than, I'll go back to five again. A little easier to see that way. Um, if I do less than, now I'm only going to get four elements instead of all five elements. So I have to be careful to make sure that I'm doing it one way or the other, but I don't confuse the two. OK. All right, questions at this point. How are we doing time wise? We've got 20 minutes left. We're doing good. OK, so one of the things that we need to look at is how we use array traversals. And um, Mahmoud, I think you were the one that was saying that you don't know how to go through and structure an array so that you can reverse the order. Um, you know, there are a handful of different ways we could do that. Unfortunately, I don't think we've got time to cover, cover that specific algorithm in the 20 minutes that we've got. Um, but a, an example of how you could do that, I mean, you could set up um, a second array that has the same length so that I could kind of work backwards and I can, because I can traverse an array in any order I want, I can go from position zero to the end, or I could go from the end back to position zero again. Um, I could traverse the array and say, okay, pick whatever value is in position zero and put it in the last spot. Um, I could do like a little swap method. So I could do it without creating an extra, extra, um, an extra array. Um, I don't know if we've got time to get into that one, but I do want to talk about a couple different things we can do with array traversals. Like, for example, um, if I know I'm going to go back to like a bigger size, so we've got more values to work with. Um, I could set something up so it'll go through and tell me what the minimum value in, is in my array, or that I can count the number of minimum values in my array. Um, and to do those kind of things, we're still going to use an array traversal. OK, but now I have to set up a little series of variables to help keep track of what I'm looking for. Like, for example, let's see, I'm going to fill in some comments so we know what we're doing with all these. Um, fill each value with a, uh, each element with a random value between 1, 
let's see, between zero and nine. Um, just so that when we go back after the fact, if anybody goes back to look at these, you'll know what we're doing. Um, so let's say we want to go through and we want to identify what the smallest element of our array is. The lowest value. Okay, first thing I need to do is I need to set up some variable that's going to keep track of what that lowest value is. So I can say um, int low value um, equals zero. Now there's going to be a problem with this in a second, and I'm going to explain what the problem with this is. <clears throat> um, but now I can go through, and as I'm looking at each one of the elements, as I work my way up from zero <clears throat> to the end of my array, I can just do a little comparison. And I can say if my demo array is less than low value. So if at any point, the value that I pick up out of my array is less than whatever my current lowest value is, then that element that I picked up from my array is going to become the lowest value. Oops, my demo array. And then at the bottom, I'll put um, low value. There we go. OK, so what this should do is it should go through and it should find the lowest value that we've got. OK, um, so we'll run. Let's see what we get. OK, so ideally, it should tell me that my lowest value is 0. OK, because again, that's that's the lowest value that I've got in here. Now, because these are all random numbers, it's probably going to be difficult for me to run this and not get one, get one where it gives me 0. The question I would ask my students would be, what happens because these are all random values between 1 and 9? It's feasible that it could give me values that are 2, 5, 7, 8, 6. And I might never randomly get a 0. You know, This one has three zeros, but what if those random numbers hadn't been assigned to 0? Would this have still worked the way it was supposed to work? And the answer is not necessarily. I can't assume that because my random values are going to be placed from 0 to, to 9, that because they're randomly being put in there, I might randomly run this and have all of the values randomly be selected greater than five, in which case it's not going to tell me what the lowest value is because I started this at zero. So one of the things I caution, and here I'll give you, a, uh, I'll give you an example. Let's change our random number generator so that it gives us values uh, starting at 10. So it's going to take whatever my random number is and add 10 to it. So now you'll notice as I look at this thing, the lowest value I've got in here is 10, but it's still telling me my lowest value is zero because none of the values in my array are less than zero. So one of the things I caution my students about, when we're working with data in a data set, don't bring in outside numbers, okay? Don't assume that our lowest value is gonna be zero. Instead, what I wanna do is say, okay, let's go to our first element in our array and assume for a second that that's the smallest. OK, and that way, if by some chance the element that's in position position zero happens to be the smallest, great, I found it. But if it's not, if it's if it's not the smallest element in my array, then I know I've set my starting value to something that there will be something smaller in my array to work from. So let me go back and run this again and see what we end up with. OK, so now it's telling me, because I set my lowest value to start at 15, it's going through and it's saying, OK, well, 13 is less than 15, so we can change that. And then later it'll say, OK, well, 11 is less than 13, so 11 is our lowest. And then eventually we'll say, OK, well, 10 is less than 11. And it'll kind of home in on this 10 and say, OK, well, yeah, 10 has to be the lowest value that we've got in our list. So one of the things that I try and caution my students about is when we're working with elements of data, because we have no idea what that range of data could be, especially if we're randomizing things. Make sure that we don't assume outside things. I've got some students that like to say, um, OK, we're going to set low value equal to integer dot min value, which which would probably work. We'd probably be OK with that. I can't really go any lower than the lower value. 
but it always just makes things a little easier if we just assume that we're starting within our own data set. And that way I'm only looking at values in my data set and I'm only comparing the values in my data set. The one other thing that my students would normally point out at this point is, okay, since, since our low value is being started at zero for efficiency sake, we could technically start this at position one. Okay, we're comparing position zero to itself. It's not going to be lower, so we're not going to change anything. So either way would be okay. Um, we could we could do something like that and say, okay, compare position one to zero and, and move on and move on. Okay. Um, so any questions at this point? We're down to about 15 minutes left, so I want to be cognizant of time and make sure that I'm answering questions as we go. Okay, there is one other specific right, thing that I have a question, Rob. Oh, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, what what is the thinking on teaching one dimensional arrays and then two dimensional arrays before array list? Um, I've done it both ways. I I don't really I guess I don't really have a preference. Um, it, it's kind of nice teaching two dimensional arrays before array list because really when we get into two dimensional arrays and that's one of the topics we're going to talk about on the twenty fourth um, next month. So if you're coming back, we'll we'll get into that a little bit. Um, a two dimensional array. You know, I, I said that we could create an array of really anything. I could create an array of primitives. I could create an array of ints, doubles, booleans, characters. Um, I could create an array of um, rubber ducks. I could create an array of students. Well, when we get into 2D arrays, really what we're doing at that point is we're creating an array of arrays. So if I go into the first element of my array inside there, instead of an int or a double or a rubber duck, there's going to be another little array that I have to dig into. So, um, and, and I'll explain that in a way that's a little more clear when we have time to actually sit down and kind of unpack two dimensional arrays. Um, but, but it kind of makes for a nice, easy progression. Once you've gotten through arrays and, and your students understand that, it does make kind of a nice, logical, easy progression to just say, okay, well, now what would imagine for a second that I take this array and I put it inside the element of another array? So then that's where kind of the rows and columns come together and it, it's it's a, a nice way to teach that. So um, so I, I don't really have a preference. I've done it both ways before. Um, if I feel like my students are doing really well with one dimensional arrays and I wanna jump from there to array list because we're kind to following the same algorithms and things, I'll do that. Um, but every once in a while, I'll shake it up and I'll do two dimensional arrays first, just so that we and, and a lot of a lot of times that'll kind of, um, it'll, it'll be based on our schedule at school, if we've got spring break coming up, and I want to make sure we've got time to get in a specific project or adjust things a little bit, maybe I'll pick one topic over the other. So it fits the schedule a little better. So I don't know, I, I don't I don't know that there's really a specific you have to do this one first, or you have to do this one first. So okay. Um, the one other thing I kind of wanted to touch base on a little bit before we jump out of arrays, I'm going to jump back over to my slide real quick because this is kind of where we left off. And then if we need to, we can jump back and we could code a little more. There's a difference between what's called a traditional for loop, which is up here at the top, and what's called an enhanced, excuse me, an enhanced for loop. Um, an enhanced for loop is designed specifically to work with arrays and array lists. And what it does is instead of referencing an index position, you notice down here in the bottom, well, up here at the top, I've got this index position. In this case, I'm calling my loop control variable I because I'm referencing it as an index position. And this is going through and saying, okay, go to index position zero and set the value equal to three. Now go to index position one and set the value equal to three. This, or uh, I'm sorry, not set the value, check to see if the value is three. And if it is, add one to a counter and then check to see if the index position the value at index position four is equal to three and so on, so on, so on. Okay, so all of this up here is based on referencing a specific index. My dog just came in for a little attention. Um, the, um, the loop down at the bottom is called an enhanced for loop. And you'll notice that in, in no place in that loop is there ever an index position mentioned. Okay, so the other name for an enhanced for loop is called a for each loop. And basically what that's saying, for each integer value in my array, go through and do something with each integer value. So I'm not referencing index positions at that point. I'm literally picking up the value and doing something with it. All right. So with this one, I'm saying go to the very first value in the array, pick it up and look at it. And if it equals a three, add one to my counter and then throw it off the side, pick up the second value. And if that value equals a three, add one to my counter and move on. So there are some benefits of each. With a regular for loop, I have the flexibility to identify where I start and where I stop. I might not want to go from zero all the way through my array. I might want to start at index position five and stop at index position 10. I might want to start at index position 10 and work down to zero in reverse. Okay, so I have the flexibility to be able to do that. With a for each loop, 
I have no flexibility. It's literally going to start at the first one and stop at the last one. I don't have to keep track of index positions. I don't have to add anything that's going to increment an index position. Its job is to literally go from start to finish and look at each one as we go. The problem is <clears throat> with the top one, I've lost that flexibility, but uh, or I have that flexibility, but I, I now have to pay attention to things like less than or equal to because I could throw an index out of bounds exception. The benefit of doing this is that I'll never throw an index out of bounds exception because it keeps track of its location itself. It'll never go beyond whatever the length of the array is because its job is to do something for each element. It knows where to start and where to stop. The other issue, I guess this would be a benefit of uh, using a for loop and not using an uh, enhanced for loop. Um, because I'm referencing index positions in a for loop, I can change things. I can go out and I can say, go to the, uh, at the element at index position five and change that to a seven. When I'm down here, I can't do that because I don't have an index position to tie things back to. I'm literally creating a variable that I'm taking something out of my array and putting it into this variable called value. If I change value, that's great, but value ends up getting thrown away and I'm not tying it back to anything in my array. So this for each loop is, for each loop is used only for referencing information. I can't change things in an array if I use a for each loop, all right? Okay, so I wanna make sure we're clear on that and I can go back and I can add a little demo. We've got um, just a little under 10 minutes. I can jump back into JGRASS, but I can demo a little of that if, if you have questions about that. If not, there's one other thing I wanted to do. Everybody okay at this point? All right, well, I'm gonna test you. I'm gonna pop quiz and make sure that you understand what for, uh, enhanced for loops do. I wanna know what the output of this code segment is. And this is what I would refer to in my class as an Akbar question. Um, anybody know what I mean by an Akbar question? Isn't that like that one ruler that uh, from the 1500s in India? No, uh, you're overthinking it, it's from Star Wars. <laughs> uh, uh, there's a, a message in the, in the chat. It, it doesn't necessarily mean air, it means it's a trap. So Admiral Akbar in the Star Wars series is the one that his catchphrase is, it's a trap. So in my class, I would put a little picture of Admiral Akbar in the top corner of the screen so that my students would know this is an Akbar question. I'm always hesitant to do that when I do workshops like this because of copyright and it's gonna be recorded. So I don't put Admiral Akbar in when I know it's gonna be recorded and posted somewhere because I don't wanna violate copyright. But in my class where it's not being shared anywhere, I would do that. But the moral of the story, this is an Akbar question, which means it's a trap. So be careful as you're looking at this one. Um, and Nick, you put error. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if you were answering the question about what is an Akbar question or what is this one going to do. Um, but if you said that this code is going to produce an error, you are absolutely right. Can you elaborate and tell me why? It's because, um, it's a for each loop or enhanced for loop. So it doesn't keep track of indexes. So when you put my array at index, I, I don't think it computes that or like understands what the user is trying to do. You're absolutely right. It's going to try it. It's it's not going to throw a compiler error or anything like that. I mean, this will compile perfectly as is, but what's going to happen is it's going to throw an index out of bounds exception because as I work through this, it's saying for each integer i in my array, which as I go through the first time, the first integer i in my array is going to be nine. It's going to set i equal to nine because that's the first actual integer value. But then in this case, the, the student that wrote this code is confusing the value with the index position. So now thinking they got a zero, they're gonna plug it in down here to my array and try and display it when actually what they're gonna do is they're gonna take the nine that was the first element and they're gonna plug that in as the index position. And, and so really what this is saying is the first time I pass through this loop, I wanna display whatever is in position nine. Well, we've got nine elements that are numbered zero through eight there is no position nine, which means yes, this is gonna throw an index out of bounds exception. Good catch. This is kind of a tricky one. Okay, very good. All right, so we have about five minutes left. Um, so I have a couple other uh, like multiple choice questions we could throw up. We could answer questions if you have questions, if there's something specific that you wanna go back and we could do another little quick five minute demo in JGRASP, we can do that. Um, anybody have questions for me at this point? that we can fill in over the next five minutes? Or do you wanna see another problem? I'm good either way. Um, do you have like s some time to do like lessons like this except on other topics when it comes to computer science? 
Um, unfortunately, I, if you're talking about outside of like the two sessions I've already kind of scheduled for, unfortunately, I don't. Um, but again, that's where I would say take advantage of the, the stuff that's out in AP Classroom. Are, are you registered in AP Classroom? Yes, sir. I haven't registered since like August, but I rarely come to it because most of the time I read either the textbook or watch the videos from class. Okay. So, so take advantage, take advantage of some of the resources out there. Have you watched any of the AP daily videos that are out there with the different topics that are there? Pretty much no. Okay. With one that, video with human geography, but that's about it. Okay. Take a look at, um, when you go into AP classroom, um, go to, go to any topic you want. In fact, one of the things you could even go out, I mean, they're only, I think maximum is 10 minutes. You could go out and you could binge watch an entire unit, just like you would binge watch something on Netflix. And I mean, that would be, I would, I would actually do that. <laughs> I know that sounds really boring to go out and binge watch uh, Java videos, but, um, but you could, you could think of each one of them as like a little season and you could go out to unit one and binge watch all of the videos that are there. And like I said, the, the teachers that did those are, are top notch. I mean, they're some of the, the best around. Um, in fact, I would say they are the best around. So um, make, make sure that you watch the, the videos that are, I can't stress that enough. Go out and watch those because those are really not a lot different than what I've done today. It's just they're given in little 10 minute snippets. So if you need to watch a video on math.random, go out and find the video on math.random and you've got a master teacher that's explaining to you how math.random works with some examples and things like that. I'm also going to put the link to the uh, AP Live videos that are on YouTube from last year that they may be helpful as well. Okay, yeah. Now, the one thing I would caution with the AP Live videos from last year, just keep in mind that any reference that um, that Mrs. Westerlin and I make to the exam, those were referring to the 2020 exam, which was its own totally different animal. Um, remember, um, well, if you're if you're a student, you probably don't remember because you wouldn't have you wouldn't have um, been a part of that. But with the 2020 exam, because everybody was suddenly at home on lockdown and and everything was totally different, they did away with all of the multiple choice questions and and there were only two free response questions. So this year for the exam, we're going back to the traditional exam. Regardless of whether you do it digitally or whether you do it paper pencil, there are going to be 40 multiple choice questions that, that cover all of the different topics in the CED. And then there are four free response questions again. So, so we're back to that traditional exam. So if you do go back and watch the AP Live stuff, which again, I would recommend, um, <laughs> modesty aside, there's a lot of good information out there. Um, just keep in mind that any references to the exam, we're talking about that that bizarro, um, you know, the exception to the rule, the outlier exam for 2020 that isn't the case this year, okay? And then Rob, are, are you also involved with any of the upcoming review AP Live? Um, I am. Um, they they asked Mrs. Westerlin and I to do that again. So coming up, um, looking at my calendar on the wall here, April 19th through April 30th, um, Monday through Thursday. We're only doing two weeks of them, and it's only going to be, be Monday through Thursday this year. Uh, so there will only be eight of them. But the focus of, of the ones coming up will be specifically exam prep. So our goal, um, you know, Jill and I have already kind of been mapping out what we're going to do. We're going to have a tip of the day. Um, we're going to call it our bit of the day. You guys get a little, little preview of what's coming. Um, we're going to do our our bit of the day because there are eight videos we're looking at each day as being one bit from a bite um that was jill's idea um which i thought was a cute idea uh, but we're gonna have our tip of the day our bit of the day um, we're gonna focus on some multiple choice uh strategies and skills and then we're gonna pick one free response question every day that we'll kind of break down and work through so so um when we get to that point make sure you come out and, and join us for those two we'll put in a little plug for those Okay, we've got about two minutes left, and I'm willing to stick around another five, ten minutes or so if anybody still has questions. Thank you, sir. Hey, no problem at all. My pleasure. Oh, and I think you also helped me more than with more than just computer science today, because you reminded me of Dragons and Dungeons, and I was like, isn't that, wasn't that, didn't that used to be like some sort of show too, instead of, it's in addition to a video game? 
if your first intro to Dungeons and Dragons was a video game, you need to go back even further. I mean, back in the 80s, Dungeons and Dragons, you would lay out things on the board. And I never got to the point that I, I only played Dungeons and Dragons once or twice, but I had some friends in college that, I mean, they would actually dress up and go full on role play mode and run around campus and do Dungeons and Dragons okay. around Maybe campus. And, recording. Uh, but but it was it was Dungeons and Dragons long be long before it was a video game. And yes, there, there did used to be a cartoon version of Dungeons and Dragons too. I don't know if it was ever a movie or not, but yeah. Uh, Mr. Rob, can I ask a question, please? There is sure. a time for a question. Thank yeah. you. You are as a teacher, when you finish teaching all the 10 units, how you will go as a review before the exam date? You will go for each unit one by one, you will revise the topic, then FRQ, then MCQ, or you are just focusing on the concept and you will not go to revise the the questions and the FRQ, where you will focus, what you will focus on. Uh, okay, so I want to so I want to make sure I understand the question. The question is, what do I do after I've covered all ten units? How do I go back and review? Yes, exactly. Thank you. Okay, so so um, once I cover all ten units, I've got one specific project that that kind of um, if you remember back in the Grid World days, we used to have Grid World um, as a specific. Um, as as the the case study that went with us. So when we had Grid World, I I put together it, it was in fact I think it came in the Grid World package. You could do this branch of Grid World that was an Othello lab, and they had to they had to code the game Othello from scratch um, using using the Grid World infrastructure. When Grid World went away, I went back and I kind of modified that program a little bit so that we do Othello, but it doesn't it doesn't use the Grid World case, uh, the, the grid world case study as an infrastructure. And the reason I like that project um, is, is that it, it really kind of covers everything that we've gone through in the class. It covers 2D arrays, it covers one dimensional arrays, it has some array lists, um, there's inheritance built into it, there's one part that you could do recursively if you wanted to. Um, it, I mean, it really covers all of the topics in one big ginormous project. Um, so we do that. We do a lab that they have to go back and apply everything we've learned. And that lab could be anything. It doesn't have to be Othello. You could, you could come up with your own or you could come up with a little series of labs that combine them in different ways. But then we do do an actual, we take one of the, the um, released practice tests and we'll go through and work through that. Um, we do, I do free response questions with my students throughout the year. So by the time we get through unit four, which is really kind of the end of the methods and control structures, I'll go out and I'll give them a methods and control structures free response question. So, so we, we will, after I've covered all 10 units, we'll do maybe a couple more practice free response questions, but those won't be the first ones that I will have done with my students. We will have hit free response questions as we've gone kind of through the, the curriculum. Um, and then I'll break things down and we'll pull up the scoring guidelines and I'll have the students score their own. And then um, we go back and we just kind of review as necessary based on how things go with the multiple choice. You know, if, if, if we work through the multiple choice and a large number of the students in the class miss questions that deal with recursion, then we'll, we'll take a couple of days and we'll go back and we'll, we'll review recursive algorithms. Um, so I kind of use that multiple choice, the, the practice multiple choice is kind of a guide of what things, what specific topics we need to go back and polish off a little bit. Man, these AP exams sound like dead week in college. I'm sorry? These AP exams that I'm going to take are going to sound like dead week in college. I've had students that come back and say that college college exams are easier than what the multiple or than what the the AP exams are. Um, but I've also had students come back and say that because they took AP computer science, um, especially, you know, I told you the students that go into engineering and things like that, the ones that took AP computer science, they come back and feel like it set them so far ahead of some of their colleagues and their their peers in college classes that didn't take it because even even if they're working in a different language, they know how to logically design a program. So it gives them a little bit of a leg up. So, like I said, I'm I'm fine sticking around another five or ten minutes. But Aaron, did you have anything that you needed to? Uh, nope the the screen I, I went ahead and shared it just while while you were talking. That's fine. People can see um, contact information for Advanced Kentucky, myself, and Rob. We're all on that screen. If you have questions, send him an email. I'm sure he'll be happy to uh, get back to you as as will. Uh, myself and Advanced Kentucky. Recording will be posted to the, the bit.ly link on the screen there. You can also view uh, previous recordings of our past sessions with Mel Hoffert, as well as uh, the upcoming session on April 24th. Rob is back to cover more array uh, topics. And um, other than that, I, th that's all I've got. If, if you are a teacher and you are interested in a mock exam, check out the bit.ly website as well. I know a couple of your names I, I've sent emails to, but if you're interested in that, check that out as well. 
Um, but other than that, uh, yeah, if you have any other questions, we'll, we'll hang out for a few minutes. Other than that, uh, hopefully we'll see you back next month. So take care. Yeah, next month, sir. I guess that's how you say it. <laughs> <laughs> that works.